Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Welcome to Trust the Journey. I'm Jason Maledsky. I'm here today with my friend, my good friend, Mick Knutson. I've been looking forward to this. I'm sure we've been looking forward to this for quite some time. I have been. We're doing another episode of Walking Each Other Home. Uh, Walking Each Other Home is a show on the Trust the Journey channel in which we take deeper dives into our journey together as humans and what inevitably is a long walk towards the end of our life. And the epicness of these journeys and how we show up for each other and the challenges that we encounter on our journeys and taking deeper dives into the connections that we develop and the actual walk of each other home. And it's a quote from Ram Dass, the great teacher. So it's a pleasure to have Mick here on the show today. And just as a reminder, trust the journey. Uh, we're here to create conscious connections, to grow and contribute through a practice of openness, honesty, vulnerability, humility, and trust. Trusting the entire journey. If you want to find us on the internet, trustthejourney.today is our handle on every channel, whether that's on YouTube, on iTunes, on Spotify, on SoundCloud, on Patreon. You can become a supporter of the show and put some money where your mouth is, and that will really go a long way for keeping the show going and the production of it. And we'd like to thank Kimberly Joy Voice, our podcast editor for making it all happen for us. She does a fantastic job and she's just a wonderful human and Mick knows her well. Yeah. Yep. And um, so Mick, let me introduce you a little bit and see Great. if I can um, touch on a few points. Sure. I first came to know you through Blink Magazine. Correct. So how long did you do that for and what was that? Um, so I started it um, in 1994 and it was because there was a vacuum of information in base jumping and I was uh, very excited about base jumping and I just felt there was a, this new medium called the internet that was just coming out and you know I wanted to share that medium. And so I did it pretty intensely um, for a while. Um, probably till the early 2000s. And then at that point, you know, there was a lot of conflicting um, draws on my life, trying to make a choice of, you know, what am I going to do? I had been married at that point. And so my focus went into uh, my actual career versus doing this as more of a, a side thing. And it kind of slacked off. And um, it still kept going where we still started doing the base fatality list, the BFL on there. Mm -hmm. But it really wasn't a communication platform anymore because, one, I wasn't there full time to do it. And that's what it really took. You were I mean, I was there yeah. 40, 60 hours a week after my normal job. Yeah you know, curating conversations with people. Um, so um, summarize what was the platform? What what was its goal and what did it, how did it function? Well, the goal was really, you know, a, ch a chat medium to talk about various aspects of base jumping, you yeah. know, all aspects of base jumping. And it was just an online forum and chat um, and uh, a wiki for news articles, for, for different uh, knowledge articles mm -hmm. to be you know, condensed into one place. A repository to collect information for yeah. people to reference because and that it, really didn't exist. At exactly. The time. It did not exist at all. Yeah. yeah. And so all of base jumping at that time, base jumping was learned as a word of mouth mentorship type program. Yeah. There were no schools. No. There was nowhere you could just like sign up to learn to base jump mm -hmm. or take, you know, no courses. It was strictly a mentorship based thing where you got to find somebody who knows how to do it and get them to say, okay, I'll teach you. Willing to. And, yeah, <laughs> get somebody who's willing to teach you and capable to teach you to just take you out and, and teach you how to do it. Correct. And that was a very challenging thing. And I, I so thank you, Mick, yeah. because I use that resource a lot. Right. And I learned to base jump on the internet in 1994. In wow. 1994, yeah. I got an article, how to base jump, mm -hmm. like a two page article from Walt Appel. Yep, I remember his stuff, yep. right? And it was very simple, like use a longer bridle, use a bigger pilot chute. Here's the slider up, slider down differences, what to do with your brake lines, like a very basic breakdown. Yeah, right. And I literally had these couple pieces printed out because I didn't even know how to use the internet. <laughs> My friend printed it for me and I took those and went and did the rigging and went and made jumps. Right. And right. just followed. So a lot of people did. A lot. Of, so that was the only thing, right? Like you either, you learn it on your own and trial and error and yeah. error, mostly error, error in the world of base jumping is life altering. 
at minimum. Yeah. It can be life altering, it can be life ending. Yeah, you know I was like, at minimum it's life altering. Yeah. At the, especially then. Yeah. Not so much not as much now. It's gotten better, obviously, with technology and the knowledge, but when a lack of knowledge, you're winging it. Yeah. And what you don't know, you don't know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that site that you curated for that period of time, I feel like it was a critical piece of base jumping's development. It bridged the gap between you learn directly from a mentor in a one-on-one -on -one environment, or you could actually, someone like me, I went to all the surrounding drop zones in my area looking for people who base jumped. Mm -hmm. And I literally went, like drove to the dump. I'm like, does anybody here base jump? Because I want to learn. Mm -hmm. And nobody. Go to the next drop right. zone. Does anybody here base jump? No, nobody. Because nobody really did it. There was yeah. a very small number of people. Yeah. And the people who did aren't going to tell you that they do. And yeah. they're usually not at the drop zone anyways. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so I was just there blind. And I'm like, I'm either going to do something really dumb, like go and try and like, completely start from ground zero and figure it out on my own or i'm finding this resource and it's helping to guide and guide me to other resources right right, right? and other people possibly. other people exactly other mentors. and so that's what happened it took me yeah. to bridge day nice. and it took me to some of the people at bridge day mm -hmm. like uh johnny utah yeah. uh, nick nick de giovanni mm -hmm. um harry parker mm -hmm. um todd yeah, uh, Shubotham. Shubotham, yeah. yeah. So a, a huge amount of people, resources of information, right? Yeah. And I wanted to say thank you for that. It was my pleasure. I really enjoyed doing it. I really enjoyed seeing people get the same enjoyment out of base jumping and safety that I did. Yeah. You know, I, I basically had, a, you know, a lot of uh, old time mentors that were really strict about you know being safe about it because they knew the implications and they instilled that in me and you know i wanted other people to in, be able to enjoy this sport because it changed my life it so, really changed my life so when did you start um i started learning in 92 and then i you know again the mentorship can be anywhere from you know it used to be a couple years yeah it is what it used to be not any, you know yeah. obviously not anymore but uh you know it was a long road just trying like you're saying trying to find oh who's this yeah. what's you know who can i find that'll teach me nobody wanted to share that and then it took a long time to finally get that information and find anybody and then you know it was you know little information at that only what that one person knew not what everybody collectively knew. So that's a huge difference. A huge, huge difference. Right. Yeah. One person's guidance, as experienced as they might be, one person's guidance <laughs> is still a singular opinion. Yeah. And one of my, um, this this is the statement that I give to people whenever they say, can you give me some like, guiding advice? Like, what's your overall, um, you know, direction? How do I figure something out? I say, Get as much reputable information as you can from as many sources, sources. as possible Absolutely. and then collectively aggregate that together and come up with what you think to be the kind of, you know, the average of all that information Correct. so that you can, you know, be as most likely to stay out of those of those brackets near the end that end up where things happen. Exactly. Right? Try exactly. and stay in the middle. Yeah. I agree with that very much. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the challenge. It was the challenge. Now with the internet, it's not really a challenge anymore. It's, it's you know, it, we have other things now, yeah. you know, that are challenges. So now there's all kinds of courses. There's right. lots of different resources available on the internet um, and in person. And you're getting the amalgamation of many people's knowledge. Correct. Right through uh, companies like Apex or Learn to Base Jump or any of the other examples that are out there where you've had people spending decades or the last majority of their lives investing into teaching. You know? Correct. Yeah. Which is great. Which is really helps, you know, the new person coming in. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me how base jumping has changed you. Oh my gosh, so many ways. Um, it's helped me understand um, it's helped me to understand myself, what's important to me, because what I really found, especially early on, I don't think a lot of people get, new jumpers don't get the same view or implication as we did, or especially I did when I started. For me, when I started, the implication was, if you are not present right this second when you're doing this jump and you're not ready to handle what you're about to endeavor into, 
at minimum, it's going to be life altering in a very bad way or it's life ending. Now, we don't have that same implication because of safety and stuff. And there's places to jump that are super easy. We even have base jumping for, you know, tandem base jumps. Yeah. And so for me, the change was to understand to take every moment seriously and not just my base jumping but that boiled over into my other life i'm like wait a second when i go and i'm base jumping if i am taking this moment so seriously and i have no clue if this is going to be my last moment and then i started thinking i've heard people go on base jumps and that's fine and they get run over by a drunk driver on the way home i'm like i realize now that there's all these other things in life that make things critical and it has made me less passive with life because it is so precious i don't know and so to be able to see that clarity is sometimes very overwhelming because it's so you know the stimulus is so intense because you're seeing every little thing. Or I remember the first base jump where I freaked out because the hairs on the back of my hand were moving with the air. And I was that in tune with my whole body. I'm like, what was that? I'm like, I'm, my whole yeah. body is alive. My yeah. whole soul and self is alive. And that didn't happen before base jumping for me. So I, it's a beautiful description. I, I really relate and I appreciate yeah. the context of the awareness of the value of the present moment, right? Like we're realizing, okay, if I put myself in a life threatening situation of stepping off of some object and putting myself in free fall and literally being seconds away from the end of my life, like we, we've clicked the countdown timer very clearly said, okay, it's three seconds till it all stops. And that gives us a frame of reference that we don't have until we do that. And then once we do that, then we start to say, oh, this is actually happening all the time. It is. This is actually <laughs> happening all the time. I'm sitting wasting my life on Netflix or I'm working Certainly. away at some job that I don't care about. Right. Or in a relationship that's not, you know, feeding me or watering me or lifting me up. And right. there's all these things. And so um, I think that the beautiful journey in this and this is part of the trust, the journey. And part of why I wanted to have you on the show right, right. is I can very much relate to, you know, you and I started a very similar time, mm -hmm. a couple of years behind you. Yep. And we've been on very similar crisscrossing paths for many years. Mick and I saw each other. We've seen each other jumping. We've seen each other doing our thing and yep. being in our lives. And we never really connected. Yep. And it wasn't until a certain number of things changed as far as who each of us were and are were who we were and who we are now who we are becoming because of the things that led up to that point yeah and and not to interject but meaning to talk Please. about you know we 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 built up these things and we're a, we are a, you know a, our own little universe of experience that have that have happened to us individually and as we transform, and I, th I, you know, we've talked before me and you about this, and yeah. I'll tell you my view about it. As I've progressed through base jumping and I have continued to see what it is for other people, how it's progressed, what it becomes for me, what I've done is I've been able to introspect and really understand more about what base jumping was for me when I started and what it has transformed into. Because at the end of the day, yeah. everybody is doing things in their life for a reason. Now, let's specifically talk about base jumping. We're base jumping for a reason. Some people actually are doing it for YouTube. Some people are doing it for ego. Some people are doing it for a reason they don't quite know about. Yeah. But they know they feel something in their body. Some people do it in PTSD because it's the only way they can feel. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you have to understand if you want to have purpose with doing this and you have to be purposeful, I feel, with approaching this part of life going that, hey, I am really putting myself out there 
and there's an implication to that. There needs to be a purpose. If there's not, then you may be doing it and not understanding that, hey, this moment is all you have right now. But if you have purpose, you understand why you're doing it. I understand why I have done it in the past. I understand why I do it now. Like, they're why? not the same reasons anymore. They're not the same reason. No. no. I agree with the reasons I did it before because that's what I needed then. Yeah. And I'm really lucky I was able to come through that because now the reason I do it is completely different, like completely different than what it was. Yeah. And I am honest with myself about that reason. And it doesn't matter if anybody else understands that reason because some people still look at me and like, what the hell are you doing? It's It's mine. It's something I do for me personally, and it's something that still keeps me connected with my own journey and my purpose in the journey that I'm continuing on with. So um, everybody has the things that they do, right? Like whether you um, race cars or build hot rods or whether you, you know, sailboats or whatever the thing is that you do with your time, raise a family, you know, build a business, you know, uh, go to church. All the things are just how we choose to choose to spend our time really. And it's about whatever we do with our time in some way soothes us. Right. With, like with the it, purpose it, we feel important about. Yeah. There's kind of value in it. Right. Yes. There's some value in doing that. And so I really relate to the the why of why I started jumping was because I didn't feel any feelings like my feelings were like all negative, sad, anger, PTSD. Mm-hmm. And so I started jumping <clears throat> for the whole purpose of like, wow, I feel alive. I feel like aware like my eyes are wide open and i'm present and i'm actually calm as opposed to like just in a state of anger all the time the rest of the time i was just angry even if i didn't know that i was angry all the time and i didn't know it at the time like when i did when i started jumping i didn't know how i was all the time at all like i had no consciousness of how i actually was right right until i started doing something that made forced me to start being consciously aware of what how I'm feeling how I'm acting what my present state of mind is and how that's going to relate to what I'm doing and now that's a rollover into every single moment of life right right exactly the same same here I mean now it's like I did it before I didn't you know just reflect I used to do mine you know, for my upbringing, um, there was a lot of trauma I had from my childhood that made me very fearful of doing things, even though I felt like the world was big and overwhelming and I wasn't good enough to be able to handle it. And and I was told by a lot of people as I grew up that I wasn't good enough to handle it. And for me, base jumping was this thing that it was almost, you know, you know, you, you can't handle it because you're not good enough. And I'm like, well, Am I? Can I control those feelings? Because the same thing like you, there were so many feelings. I just felt paralyzed. And I'm like, oh, that's not what I want. I don't want to go through life paralyzed or not being able to do anything and control these emotions in my body that I don't even know what they are. So for me, I walked up to those emotions and said, these are really overwhelming, really scary. And I want to understand what they are, why they're there and how I can coexist with those feelings instead of being overwhelmed by those feelings. So it's a control that like at the essence of it all, it's like wanting to feel a sense of control of some Over, uh, of yourself, of yourself or, or of the just a sense of control, because I know we, we all of us in our life journey, we all struggle with this need to feel feel like we have control of what's happening so that we can feel some kind of peace that goes with that. But in the end, I think what we end up realizing, and so skydiving or base jumping or any anything, any activity, we start realizing we're not actually in control. No. Right? No. We're we're not actually in control. No. We're the what's occurring is occurring. And we all we all have these life experiences mm-hmm. that say to us we feel like we're in control and all of a sudden something happens to prove we're not. <laughs> exactly. Right? Exactly. And we get that sharp reminder to go, oh, we're just participating in this grand adventure. Yeah. And there's an illusion of control. Correct. And so I think one of the things that happens with this endeavor to 
to find it. Like we were you when we're young, we try to like create this concept of uh, I can I can control what I'm feeling. I can control how I'm acting. Mm -hmm. I can yeah. have some sense of control. But then then we start to go, oh, I can have some some of the control. But then there's an element that's always outside of my control. And I just have to accept that. Right. And then with that comes a, a peacefulness that, at least for me, I'm like, oh, at some point, I'm actually not at the wheel. No. You no. know? Yeah. Because we don't actually choose when we die. No. No. Unless we commit suicide. Exactly. Yeah. Unless we commit suicide, when this is over, isn't really up to us. And that could be... In 30 seconds, there could be an earthquake and the building collapses. Right, right. Or yeah. in 30 years, we could die slowly with loved ones around us. Correct. And any version of that in between. So It's possible. So that, for me, is this like awe-inspiring thing of like, whoa, I really don't have any control of what's happening here. But I, there are things that I can, I can lean the direction that they're going in. And... So I want to pivot. Or, or yeah, I want to add one more thing before we pivot. Though, yeah. um, one of the things when I started, you're right. It was about trying to have control. I thought, oh, okay, I can control this. I started being able to control those emotions and being able to focus on doing a jump that otherwise would have made me um, had too many feelings that I could control, and you know, then I wouldn't do it. I've walked off of jumps before. But as I progressed, I know now it's not about controlling those feelings, but with other people like maybe Benet Brown or other people who write things about understanding your feelings, it's not about controlling the feelings. It's now about looking at those feelings, accepting them, and just letting them be felt instead of having them overwhelm you. I'm able to now look at them and say, okay, I know what these feelings are, positive or negative, and instead of me trying to subdue them with control, I'm just, yeah. okay, here they are. How does this make my body feel, my mind feel? Because they're in there, let's just let them have their existence. And now I live into those feelings because I'm letting them happen. It's so different, right? They're the difference between experiencing an emotion or a feeling yeah. and becoming a feeling like having that feeling to determine who we are right and i know for years i walked around being anger right rather than experiencing anger yeah. and that that concept of being able to separate the two things and you're like oh i'm i'm having an experience versus i am this yeah. or this is me now this is what happened to me and now i'm this yeah right 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 that's so powerful. Right. But it takes a long time to get to. And because it is so subtle, man, it's a lot harder to be able to view those things. To no. deal them consciously with yourself and not judge yourself about it. No, I, I don't know if I agree. No? You say it takes a long time to come to. Maybe it took us a long time. But do you well, think we, if we have the tools, if we're given the knowledge and the information earlier? Right, right. Does it take nearly as long? No, I, you're right. You're right. It took me a long time because I didn't have, you know, the direction or anything. I'm just fumbling around trying to equate what I know logically and what I feel of these emotions and what I feel of implication from where I came from. It took a long time to decipher those. I don't think it necessarily takes time. I do think it takes intention yeah. because it's too easy to just embody like that anger or the helplessness or whatever versus live through it and be like, Hey, this isn't me. This is just an emotion. My body is feeling mm -hmm. and I can change how I react to that feeling. And I don't have to just embody it. I can live through it and just view it instead of let it, you know, assume you. Yeah. So, I want to pivot and talk a little bit about growth in other areas because I was we were getting to the point where we got to meet and got to know each other. Right and now, it's been some years that we've known each other and we've been friends yeah. and we have a very deep, loving, connective, yeah. trusting, vulnerable friendship where we've been able to share lots of parts of ourselves with yeah. each other and yeah. rely on each other to be like, "Hey, I need somebody to talk to you," or "Hey, let's spend some time." And and 
and observant of each other's journey in the sense of I've been watching Mick decouple from the traditional house, job, wife, nine to five, this is life concept and recreate an entirely different structure of living right. and open up your mind and your heart to um, thinking and being in different ways right. and doing the same journey myself. The same I, thing. I, I've I, been seeing the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So we've been watching each other and seeing it from afar. Like it was really cool. This is another one of the things where the internet has brought some magic into our lives because we're able to witness each other's journey mm -hmm. from enough of a distance um, that we're not really involved in it, but we're able to be like a ping on the radar to be like, yeah, good job, man. Or cool. Thank like, you know, like I see your journey and you see mine. And so that happened for a number of years for us where, nice. yeah, it has it happened. Still is, though. It's, yeah, of course, yeah, it still <laughs> does because of social media. Yeah. Um, but I think that social media. And so I, I want to point out, point out some of the positives here. These people are always hard on social media for the negatives of what they are. And I want to point out to some of the positives because there's a lot of value in the in the internet and in social media that we don't necessarily leverage. And so I think part of our friendship is based on, and many other friendships that I have and that we have are based on this, seeing other people out there that are vibrating on a similar vibration to ourselves mm -hmm. and are on a similar path. And then having that bring us together where if it wasn't for that medium, we really would only bump into each other once in a while at a social little gathering where we're in the same place at the same time yeah, for moments. only. Yeah. For moments. And we wouldn't have the context that's like, yeah, I'm really stoked about what Mick's doing with his life. I've seen him hiking I've seen him, you know, a living out of his trailer and I've yeah. seen him, you know, doing, um, remote work lifestyle and, sure, sure. and doing plant medicine ceremonies and all these other things. And, mm -hmm. and then I'm like, Oh, there's somebody I want to hang out with. Right. You know, get to know more because we all, we all have, we all have stories. We all have our own little grouping of our experiences and it's not just base. I mean, it's everything. And the more we get to share those experiences, like you've had experiences that I haven't. And it gives me an insight as far as, um, other possibilities besides what I've done, you know, and, and those sharing of experiences, I think is what's shortening a second ago. You're talking about, Hey, it took us a long time to get to this place. Can we get to the next place quicker by sharing other information, yeah. sharing experiences, you know, that are similar that we can resonate with. I actually didn't like you at first. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know that? Like I didn't, I would love you know, to know why. I think it was just that we kind of rubbed each other or you rubbed me in a way where I was like, man, who's this guy? Like who's he's really uh, like intense and kind of abrasive in how quickly the interaction was with a lot of intensity. Right. So it's like very much like rushing the door and like, Hey, blah, blah, blah. and I'm kind of like, I don't even know this guy. So like for the amount of energy that he has in my space or this close proximity to me, I was kind of like, you know, back up, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, I think you being such a high energy person and <laughs> even, I mean, I'm the same though. This is the thing like, you're right. So I remember looking at, I could look back at some of your earlier jumping and like the colors of the team suits and rigs and like yeah. the colored hair and the flashy sunglasses and like, mm -hmm. like really flamboyant kind of mm -hmm. boisterous kind of stuff. And I was a little more kind of reserved with my like character of being like, you know, slightly different moods, but not all the time. Sometimes I'd right. be the same thing, you know? Right. Um, but yeah, I found myself a little bit put off by your energy and it took me some time to warm up to you. Mm -hmm. But now I find myself incredibly grateful for the opportunity for that friendship to deepen mm -hmm. and to have that more connected and more authentic. I think that's it. There's like a surface level thing where when we meet somebody and we're just like at the skin level and we don't really have that like heart to heart connection, right. Right. then it's there. And this is a, this is a reflection of me in a lot of ways where I don't really trust people. Right. Maybe. So if somebody comes into my space and I'm not ready to trust anybody, mm -hmm. 
then I'm going to close the door to them. Especially if they're really open, then I'm even more closed. Right, right. Because I'm not going to take that risk of like, you know, making a mistake and trusting somebody too quickly and then regretting it. Yeah, right. You know? So I think that is also a piece of uh, that of how we interacted early which, on. Which I see that too. And I, and I, I remember feeling that for a long time of our interactions. And, um, and I really never knew what it was. I was just like, what... What am I, it, it, it actually, what it really did, I understand this is a very common thing in my reality is that I get very negative um, response from a lot of people. Some of them, I don't even, you know, I can see it, but I don't even know anything about it. But it's that energy piece where people are not willing to take those chances. But the real, you know, and the issue is, is that, you know, you don't know. And it's like once we did get to know each other, we realize there's a lot of benefits we have for each other and commonality that it's about taking some of those chances to do that. And see, when we don't take those chances, what happens is you're making judgments based on your own past experience that you don't want around. And that can close you off, yeah. you know, not only to your opportunity, but also opportunity to maybe share something with other people. You know, like I said, a lot of people have closed me off because of the energy I have. And I'm, you know, and it's, you know, it comes across many different ways to many people. And then I'm just trying to be open to try to find other people that I can not just I'm not just trying to push in, you know, push things. I'm trying to listen and receive, receive that energy or receive knowledge from others as well. Yeah. And that's where we share information. That's where we start growing is when we're willing to have an interaction, not just one way. It can't be one way. No. It's got to be multiple ways. Yeah. It's funny. The commonalities are, are a lot, actually. <laughs> you, you, we're, we both DJ. Yep. Uh, we've got like similar approaches to life, tattoos, earrings. You've got my old haircut. Exactly. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and we're both base jump and we've both had nomadic careers, uh, uh, remote work lifestyles and living, yeah. you, know, you know, nomadic lives and yeah. so like very parallel paths and it's been interesting to see how this journey has brought us together because i feel like it's been notably that we're kind of like at a wide swing of yeah. each other and yeah. it's gotten smoother and smoother and smoother and then over time we've really gotten to know each other in a in a really like loving trusting way absolutely there's a word you used before is really vulnerable yeah, because that's something I, you know, am very big in my life in the last you know five years is about approaching the vulnerability that I have. Because just like you, look, you know, you say you don't trust people uh, of what you have. I don't trust my vulnerability either, and it's something that is always there that I have to manage. It's my vulnerability, and I have to find out how I open it, how I share it, and with whom I'm going to share my vulnerability with. Yeah. And it's a serious issue and a serious topic for me. I feel like you've opened up in those ways to me and been Absolutely. very trusting there. And Absolutely. I really appreciate it because that I think is what's brought us closer together. Right, right. You know, I yeah. think that's the anchoring thing is that when we show each other our weaknesses right. or the areas where we're tender or vulnerable, vulnerable. Yep. right? Yep. Like our tender spots, spots where we're like, oh, that's the spot I kind of guard naturally, mm. you know, or underbelly, then that is where we say, oh, you're just as real as I am. And it's not about kind of the the facade that we see from a distance, right? Like, yeah. we're very colorful characters, yeah. right? Um, sure, sure. Whether it's, it's the whole um, persona of like, oh, I'm Jay Boletsky, PD factory team, mm -hmm. you know, the beard and the goat, the hair and the whole costume. Mm -hmm. out. It's a costume, right? It's like playing a part in a freaking movie that's like, this is right. the superhero character that I put on to go to work every day. Exactly. And then it's the same thing. Like I've seen you in the same costumes, you know? <laughs> exactly. And exactly. at the end of the day, we're all just as vulnerable. We were all born a helpless baby. We were all a scared child. Mm -hmm. We were all a confused teenager, mm -hmm. a angry adolescent, mm -hmm. right? And then at some point we're an adult going, how the hell did I get here? And who am I now? Because I don't even know because I'm just a collection of all the things that have happened to me and right. not actually who am I? Mm -hmm. And so this is the big thing that I've seen where you and I have now become much more knitted is because the who am I question has 
arrived on the table in our lives yeah. in like the last 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, Around yeah. the last 10 years or sure. so. And it's not what do I do that makes me who I am? Mm -hmm. It's who am I when I just sit here or who am I, how, when I interact with people, what's the experience they have when they, that they leave with, that's a reflection right. of who I am and who, right. and who am I when I just sit in my own skin and <laughs> observe myself. Right, right. Right. And so this journey into self-observation, whether it's how you and I are relating right now or how we relate with anybody else that we encounter or how we relate to ourselves when I just spend a bunch of time alone. And I think that's something we both do very well, which is spend a yeah. lot of time alone. Right. And so that self-reflection, that that look inward, when did that start happening? What was the pivot? Well, the big pivot for me, I mean, yeah, maybe a decade ago, I started questioning it because it was weird. You know, when I was doing a lot of things, um, and one thing I want to say before I dig into that is, you know, some of the that persona for me, I start looking at, is that reflection of masking that vulnerability. It's like, yeah. hey, I, I want to be, you know, around people, but I have this vulnerable side. So I'm going to put something else in front of that. And to show that I'm not vulnerable when really all I really want is to somebody to say, hey, can I can I step right in one side and, you know, and trust that person that I can be vulnerable because that's really what I want to be able to share is that vulnerability because that's where the question for me is. And it has been. And it started five years ago when I broke my hand uh, paragliding in Columbia and I was forced to stop everything. My whole life stopped um, for what it was. And for a year, I traveled around in a trailer, uh, a little tiny 10 foot trailer. And you had one of those, the low The boys. low ones you couldn't stand up in. Yeah. So it was just a sleeping unit? It was a sleeping unit only. And you're pulling it behind? Uh, a, um, uh, a little, uh, oh, um, Subaru, yeah, Subaru, like a, yeah, Subaru. So a, little a, car. Tiny, a car, a car, a yeah. car, and a little trailer. like teardrop style, tear, yeah. like low trailer. Yep. So there's no bathroom in there. Oh no, no. There's no kitchen. Nope. No. No. It's just like crawl inside a little nook and go to sleep. Yeah, yeah. For a year. Drove all, drove <laughs> for all, a year. Hold on. For a year, <laughs> you dragged a little teardrop trailer around behind a car, and just lived that like that. Yeah. Yeah. And camping every day for yeah. 12 months, drove all the way to Alaska, all the way back, all, you know, mostly by myself, um, just reflecting into myself, trying to understand, okay, now that I'm with myself all day, every day, what the heck is going on? What do I, you know, what do I want? What are these feelings? And that's what really started, you know, making it really click, you know, understanding that there was a vulnerable piece that was dying to come out and dying to be understood and it really came down to being that little child again, you know, that child that never got to be. So let me ask you about, uh, we don't need to name names or anything, but um, relationship wise, is, was that you as a single person? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. It was previously, I, were you long term relationships? I had. Uh, yeah, I had been married for over 15 years and I had yeah. a few um, uh, multi year relationship with two multi year relationships. And then that was it. And then all of a sudden I'm by myself, essentially homeless. Cause I had had a home and I can't, couldn't be there. So I'm in a trailer homeless and now what, you know, so yeah. everything was upside down and I think it was thrust on me. And if it wouldn't have been that pronounced, it would have really settled in the way that I needed to. The, the program would have kicked back in. I would have gone back to work. It really wouldn't have settled in. I probably would have been delayed another 10 or 20 years of figuring this out. But it, the universe said, nope, right now is when you need to learn this. And I, I, I really just gave up. I felt like I was just nothing else. You know, everything, everything I knew was upside down. And I really just said, okay, what next? And I started looking for signs as far as things that were on my path, people I was crossing and, you know, the things I was supposed to learn. So this is a very similar journey for me, right? Like really similar journey yeah. where, um, got the great job, got the successful career, got a long-term relationship, got a house, 
everything seems hunky dory. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, I'm not happy. Exactly. I'm not happy inside because who I project out into the world that I am isn't actually me. No. It's a persona created as a shell an to armor. an armor to hold up an idea of that I've created of who I am based on all the experiences that I've had, not just who I am without those experiences. Right. Like who I would like to be shed the trauma, shed the fear, shed this the the lack of ability to be vulnerable and trust, like all the closing down, shed the walls, shed right. the armor. Who am I without the armor? Who am I without a threat? Who am I if I'm Great not point, right? Great point. Who am I if I'm just me? And so you and I had this similar experience of like, okay, long-term relationship ends. Stepping away from our comfort zone of the home that we go back to the routine of mm -hmm. I'm okay because I come home at the end of the day and have a drink and sit down in front of a TV. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's like the, that's the opiate of America is right. I'm okay because I come home at the end of a day and I sit down on a comfortable couch and I have a drink or eat something that t makes me feel good. And then I go to sleep at night. And that is the kind of this lie that we tell to ourselves. And right. so I think you and I have this similar experience in the sense that when we pull that comfortable home away, <laughs> and now we're just drifting through existence of I'm living in a car or I'm living in a van or I'm now single in the world. I don't have a codependent structure of relationship where I'm always projecting my problems onto somebody else as if they're the problem. There's no threat either. There's no threat, right? Because <laughs> it's just me. I'm the only threat to myself, yeah. right? So there's the big one. Well, yeah. That's the big one. That's we start to doing. realize that the only true threat that exists is really ourselves and what we're the way if we're armoring up all the time, then we don't actually know who we are. Right. We're not aware of how we're acting. Yep. Then we don't even know where our weaknesses are because we don't we're able to reveal them. Correct. Yeah. Then we're really becoming a threat to ourselves where we're like we're not nourishing the part of ourself that really needs love and needs attention mm -hmm. and needs healing. Yeah. And we're bolstering a part of ourself that's actually exhausting and tiresome and you can realize, become too much. I think this is what leads to so like we've lost some friends over the years to suicide. And like yeah. I, I hear myself telling this story and I can be completely honest. I've. Okay, so have you had a psychiatrist or somebody? Have you had suicidal thoughts? You hear those commercials? Yeah, right. I never understood that until a couple years ago. I realized that I had added suicide to the list of possible things I could do to deal with my situa situation. Oh, right. And I hadn't even, it was subconscious. Like I wasn't even consciously going, oh yeah, I'm having suicidal ideation or I'm having suicidal thoughts. I'm just, well, I could always kill myself. Is was like, one of the potential items on the tree of like, how can we deal with the pain that I'm feeling? Right. And it's mental pain too, is what it is. It's not even yeah. physical pain. Yeah. So most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so we've lost some friends to that. And I feel like that holding up of this persona and this character right. becomes so exhausting yep. that it, eventually starts to wear us down to where we either can't hold it up and we give up mm -hmm. we give up trying or we start making really bad decisions well, and we start acting long, out right it doesn't take long to do that you know with with any type of substance that you're trying to you know use to numb yourself or for that matter even base jumping if anything, for the anything wrong at all. reason anything you're Sugar, doing to numb it, alcohol it could be behavior patterns exactly yeah everything. exactly right and that's where I had felt I had the advantage of spending a year by myself, which was not pleasant. I wouldn't have not have would not have wanted somebody else there because it would have just been so didn't much look fun. It didn't. It wasn't. But um, but it was very, you know, enlightening to see this person that all of a sudden shedding these armor because the armor wasn't there. Nobody was there to, to put the armor up. But all of a sudden I see this person. I'm like, 
Who are you? <laughs> yeah. What are you? T-? And I started. You put the armor up for yourself in the mirror. Yeah, absolutely. And you're like, oh, it would be me. And then you're like, who am I defending myself yeah. from? Yeah. And then one thing I did that was really helpful. I still talk. I talk about this a lot. I really feel strong about this. I that year I started talking myself out loud. Me too. And I feel strongly that everybody should do that. Yeah. Because I started saying things to myself, and I'm just, you know, they made sense in my head when I'm thinking about it. But as soon as I spoke them out, I'm like. Mick, what the hell are you talking about? That that makes no sense whatsoever at all. But I only realized that by having a dialogue verbally with myself and then realizing how how ignorant some of these things we're doing are. I'm like, how did I ever think that that was a good idea? I've been doing this for decades. And, you know, instantly you're like, OK, I got to shed that because that I mean, that really is just that's that's ludicrous. It's insane to think that that would be right for me. And I had to dig into that to understand what all of these crazy things were. And I was always expecting to have some other outcome. We've heard this before. If you do the same thing over and over and expect a different outcome, that is the definition of insanity. And so for me to really understand these things I was doing that I didn't even know I was doing, yeah, you know, or the persona or the armor that I had up, and, you know, that's where a lot of them started shedding because they just serve no more purpose except negative purpose. Once I really had an honest view of them. So that I can go back to our first interactions. That armor was so present to me and I had right. mine on. We were both like fully armored. Oh, sure. We're like, Kadunk. yeah, ready for battle. Man. Yeah. <laughs> so there was no way to connect. Right. Like there was With no, anybody probably. Yeah. There was no like deeper part of that. So mm-hmm. I really see that now when I when I look at the it. same. I and now a lot of people now actually. as that's peeled back, I'm like, oh, there's a huge there's a there's a not only a nice person. You're an amazing person. So let me just say <laughs> over the time that I've come to know you in the last five years, I'm realizing I'm like, man, Mick would do anything for anybody he will go out of his way to make sure that people are nurtured cared for extend the good arm of the samaritan to a total stranger you know anybody is just as cared for and i think this is one of the things that's really helped to anchor our friendship as i see that excuse me but nature nurture nature yeah and it's been um something i could observe in you that I also feel like I have in myself, which is like, if somebody needs something, I'm going to be there for them as much as I can. And it's even been to the extent of like, when you spent some time with my first wife, you know, and she was, she was alone and she's like, I need somebody to just hang out with this week. Go hiking. Yeah. Yeah. Go hiking. And so that's another thing I wanted to to get to in our conversation as well is is the hiking. Let me, let me me say one thing about what you're saying about, you know, total stranger or, or, you know, not maybe a total stranger, but you know, almost anybody of that time that I spent alone, I started, you know, decomposing this armor and I started realizing that, oh my gosh, we're all in this same problem. We all have the same issues. We all came the same way. I don't care if I know you or not. I already know you have come up the same way I have in, in general, and we all have these same struggles. So to look at somebody being very angry, I'm like, well, it's not really angry to me. It's, well, I'm what a bummer, man. I'm somehow you've instilled anger from how you've come up, and that's what your armor is. I start seeing it more uh, as not something that's personal, but something that is the armor that we have until we learn to grow past that armor that we don't need it. We outgrow that armor, hopefully at some point in our life. Shedding a skin. Shedding a skin. Yeah. Or multiple skins. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, so I really believe that it is, there's these periods where mm-hmm. we grow inside of ourselves, and we either hit that limit and yeah. back away from it. Yeah. Or we hit it and we're like, I can't live in this way anymore. It needs to change. Yes, yes, yes. You know, and so... There are these very clear metamorphoses that occur. And everybody's like the midlife crisis is a stereotypical example of like, oh, you turn 40 and all of a sudden, boosh, you know, and until you're 40, you don't know what that is about. And then when you hit 40, you go, oh, there this is. is a real deal thing. Yeah. Yeah. It actually happens to everybody because we start to get to this trajectory in our life where it's not, and they say over the hill, right? We get a different angle, a different perspective on life. And we go, wait, what have I been doing with my time? 
Mm-hmm. How have I been spending my energy and my time? And what's, what am I actually getting back out of it? Right, right. And is the value there? Because you suddenly start to realize you have only a limited amount left. Mm-hmm. And so this takes us back to our whole beginning of the conversation, right? Where we're like, oh, I have a time frame reference. Exactly. On the journey. Mm-hmm. And you go, well, if I've only got three seconds left, I want to be right here right now. I want to be present and I want to value the time that I have. And yeah, yeah you can't, you know, I mean, in a base jump, you can't, in two or three seconds, you can't live your whole life. But what it gives you is the perspective to say, during the time that I have, or while I am living my life, I want to be present. I want to be authentic. I want to be vulnerable because I want a connective relationship with somebody, not an armored, want to see my persona? Want to see my ego? (laughs) Because, exactly, you know, who cares? I don't, I don't, I don't. I want to have a relationship that says, man, I had a fucking hard day today and I'm not feeling good. And are you okay with that? Now I'm going to love you more. Because you're being authentic. Because it's authentic. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly true. Right. Talk to me about the hiking. Hiking was very interesting. Again, remember um, when I broke my hand, um, I went out on camping, you know, um, for a year out of a trailer. But that was... um, you know, really wasn't doing anything active. And I kept remembering that, you know, driving around, not being able to hike or do anything because my my arm and my surgery, um, you know, looking it up at a far off point and going, you know, all I really want to do right now is get out of this car, get out of the trailer, hike up to the top and I don't know, just camp up there. And I just, that's exactly what I kept thinking about. And, and then at the same time, every single day, I'm just dialoguing myself for 10, 12, 16 hours by myself, you know, having these conversations. And so then what I did, my first hike was actually a Tour Mont Blanc in uh, Chamonix, France. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I did a 12-day hike by myself, um, you know, uh, around the Swiss Alps, uh, the Swiss and French Alps. And I remember it was physically really you know, tough. And I'm like, wow, man, I'm not doing what I need to do for my body. It made me really feel like, Uh Hey, I'm obviously not taking care of this thing. And it's telling me that I'm not, but then I got a feeling, I went down to Arizona and there was the Arizona trail. I'm like, I need to try this again. I mean, I started getting myself better, eating better. And then I started doing the Arizona trail. And then I realized You know, I'm by myself for several weeks at a time, sleeping out in the middle of nowhere. It's not even really hardly, you know, big trail to, you know, you're just, you know, sleeping in a little, little patch that's open in in the rocks. And I started realizing the dialogues that I was having wasn't convoluted with cell phones or TV or cars. I'm out there in the middle of the wilderness for weeks at a time. And I just felt so connected with myself. Then I decided to go do two months on the Continental Divide Trail. Same thing. I'm hiking through there every single day. And after about three weeks, it just was, this was my life. I, we, I hike every day and I dialogue every day and I see the wilderness every day. And just, it was nothing but conversations with myself that really made me understand my thoughts, my feelings, what I really wanted, what I really didn't want, the ego things that I didn't want, the armor I didn't want. And it really became very addicting to be in that space of freeness. And it was just a beautiful, you know, experience. And I still, you know, do these hikes to be able to disconnect from everything and connect with just me physically. And all it is is about taking care of myself because it's survival. I, all I have to do is take care of me. I don't have to take care of anything else, anybody else around me. And then that is where I feel like I really started understanding myself more and more by isolating that. So it was a similar path. Again, <clears throat> my first big hikes were in oh, 2008. Mm-hmm. Uh, I started going to Alberta mm-hmm. and hiking long sections in Banff and Jasper National Park. I went to Patagonia and hiked a bunch in Patagonia. And then base jumping as well. Started pulling more and more hiking in Norway and in the Alps. And um, the and then eventually the Appalachian Trail. Right, 18. Right? Yeah. And so I've seen this similar path in ourselves as well of like, oh, 
I'm going to just disconnect from all these things that I think are who I am in my life and what's important. Yeah. And you certainly go realize you're like, well, what's important is um, food and water and my ability to have a sense of well-being, right? Like right. I need to be able to take care of myself in the very simplest of forms. Like I'm going to need to make shelter and sleep in a somewhat comfortable and warm way tonight. And I'm going to need to have enough food and water. And I'm, and then that's really it. it. That's yeah. it. That's really all we need. That's it. And the dialogue, it's going to happen all the time, right? Like, so whatever environment we put ourselves in, we're going to be having a dialogue with ourselves. And there's two things I want to touch on here. One is you said disconnect, but to me, it's really a connect. Why well, disconnect from everything else? So you I can't you connect just, to it because it's you not You disconnect there. from the noise. Yes. But you connect to who we truly are, which is we are nature. Right. Right. We are the natural world. We are bio organisms that are born into this planet. And we're going to die and we're going to become the planet again. Yeah. We're going to become the planet. We are the planet when we start and we're going to be the planet again when we're dead. Yeah. We're going to be dirt. <laughs> yep. Right? Yep. And so True. connecting with that is really connecting with ourself. And right. especially the solo hikes, like being alone in the wilderness. Yeah. With nobody else. That's, That's the hard I, part, too. I love, yeah. I love being alone in the wilderness. Yeah. I went for an hour 20 minute hike yesterday to end of the day to recenter myself yeah. and to go push my body and make my body work really hard, even though it hurt. And later yeah. I'm like, ow, oh, that was painful, <laughs> you know? Right. But in the end, this is, this is reconnecting. And I want to touch on this because so many of us in the, in the modern world, we're disconnecting from ourselves through dissociative behaviors, mm -hmm. right? We're yeah. dissociating through either taking drugs that are dissociating us from what we're doing or who we are or what our lives are, or we're dissociating by sitting in there and scrolling into whatever, some other thing that's a distraction, right? right? It's and we're not just, us. It's not us, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I really just wanted to emphasize the value in yeah. spending time alone and disconnected yeah. from the noise and connected with our true nature, right. which is just simply we need water and air and food and exercise and right. somewhere to sleep. Yeah, something I, I mean, because a lot of people ask me about, about uh, you know, the, the hikes that I do because some of them are really big. And one thing I tell people is, you know, uh, I think it's really important to go out, like I said, even if you're only talking five to seven days by yourself. But one of the key things, people go out there and then they want to listen to, you know, a podcast or a book or music for that matter. And I, I tried that at first and I realized that that still wasn't disconnecting me from the other noise. It still was giving me that comfort and I was never able to connect to myself. Once I turned all of those things off, and I'm just sitting there listening to, you know, the wind and listening to animals that are around me and just listening, then talking to myself, not anything else. That's when it really started clicking. That's but that was scary because it's like, oh, my God, now it's just me. Um, and the first few three, four days, five days are really hard, it's terribly hard. Yeah. But when you get past that, when you're willing to make that that commitment to yourself to get past that, all of a sudden there's a calmness and clarity that came over me by getting past that that level. This is the same like the two minute mark in a cold plunge. It's right. When you hit that two minute mark, mm. up to that, it's so brutal. <laughs> it's brutal. Yeah. You're just like, ah, everything is at 100. Yeah. Ah, it's all this noise. Mm -hmm. And then we hit this two minute mark. And then everything kind of calms down and, yep. and it, it gets serene and, and spacious and mm. it's, it's soothing. Right. Right. Yeah. And whether that's, you know, the fifth day that you're alone in the woods or whether that's the two minute mark on the cold plunge or whether that's your return for the fifth time to ceremony. Right. Mm -hmm. Any of those examples, all the examples that are out there, they we get so attached to this idea of who we are is what we're doing and the things that we're surrounded by. Right. And 
I think what I'm trying to pull us back to is this recognition that we're both identifying in ourselves is that who I am, who you are, who we are is nature. And that at our core, we're actually really peaceful yeah. and connected. Right. We just got to get back there. We got to be willing to go through that two minute mark, that five day mark, whatever it is. Yeah. And then we will be able to get back there. And then you'll really be able to reconnect with the true self. Yeah. But it sometimes takes more time to keep trying to do that. You'll learn more and more about yourself by continuing to try to, to, try to revisit that. Do you want to talk about plant medicines at all? Sure. I, I love plant medicines. I um. I basically, uh, you know, I guess my experience I've done, um, you know, I, I actually still uh, more frequently love uh, psilocybin mushrooms, which I feel give me a connection to my my uninhibited brain oh. and uninhibited mind. But I have also, you know, over the last three years um, started uh, going to ayahuasca ceremonies. I've been to seven of them now. Um, and each time you know, there was, uh, you know, obviously an effort to, to take the plant. Well, see, especially ayahuasca, you have to, there's an effort, you have to commit to doing it and it's not always necessarily pleasant, but every single journey that I've been on, even if it started off unpleasant has always ended pleasantly with some new epiphany that goes past the ego goes past that armor right away. And that's the scary part. You're like, wow, I thought I had armor up. I'm like, no, you didn't. You didn't have any armor up. We're taking it all off. And that's, you know, a really beautiful, you know, piece of it. And those, you know, the plant medicine naturally, again, to go back to nature, it shows us who we are naturally and allows us to see ourselves without judgment and understand the things that, you know, that, well, at least for psilocybin, it under, it helps me understand and other people that I've gone with, you know, to understand that other, those other things that build up to who they are. And now they can decide how to react to them or how to confront them or how to live with them moving forward versus just armoring them up or, you know, numbing them out. Numbing. Otherwise, yeah. numbing is the way. Yeah. It's armor or numb, right? It is. Yeah. Huh. Uh, Mick, thank you. Dude, this has been great. I really appreciate it. I yeah. appreciate you, you know, and, I, and, you know, just to go revisit that when you said uh, earlier about, you know, I remember seeing our bumping in and I remember that, you know, as I started this other journey of mine, I was like, I knew something else was there with you, you know, and I knew there was something deeper. And then I started seeing other things coming out of me. And I really knew that I wanted and I felt that, that there was some connection. And if we could get past that armor, that we would have a lot of, um, you know, a lot of symbiosis with, you know, where we've been and where we also want to go. And, and also for me, where I want to share that with, because I understand the struggles. We both understand the struggles and there's so many people, friends, you know, even acquaintances that now in hindsight, I can look at it and go like, Oh man, I remember being there, man, if I could only somehow help that next step for you, like I was able to take, I got lucky to get it. And so it's now a matter of, you know, trying to share the experiences that I've gone through yeah. and hopefully also be able to have other people benefit from this transformation we are. Thank you. you know, you're so yeah, welcome. I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate you, buddy. I agree, I mean, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> That's okay. uh, you're good. Thank you so much. I want to um, just remind all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to support the program, uh, you could like, you can subscribe, you can make comments on any of our channels. You can support us on Patreon. That is a huge value. It does take a lot of money to produce a show. And if you do join as a Patreon supporter in any amount, you become a member of the Trust the Journey family. And Mick is now going to become a trusted mem a member of the it. family. I'm excited. And that is a specifically curated space. It's a Facebook group where we all hold space for each other to be vulnerable and authentic and real. And we know that it's a safe space because we created it and we hold it there. And this is a practice that 
we can do in our everyday lives and become more accustomed to and more familiar with by having spaces that we do that together. So it's a great training ground for how can we do this for your, for ourselves in one place and we can transition that to somewhere else and we can nice. transition that to somewhere else. And so this safe container that we've just held to open up and share is an example of that. The Trust the Journey family is another example. I invite you to join us and I invite you to hold and create those spaces for yourself and your family and the people that you care about in your life and walk each other home because we're all on the same journey. We've we all, all are on the same journey. It's all been the same. We're all coming from the same thing. We're all going to the same place. So yeah, we're all nature. We're all love. I love. Thank you. Thank you, man.